So welcome everybody to another very interesting, I'm sure, interview with a very special person and friend of mine, Michelle Lee Weldon. And I'm gonna let her- Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm gonna let you introduce yourself in a second, but I'll just give you the quick frame for those of you listening why you should join us today. We're gonna to be talking about trauma. And one of the things I've noticed in working with couples, hundreds of couples over the years, is that a lot of the troubles that couples get into can be traced back to some kind of childhood trauma. And Michelle is an expert in trauma. She is a, I'm looking down because I'm reading. She's a licensed professional counselor. She's a certified neurosculpting fellow. I'll get her to explain all this stuff in a moment. <laughs> a yoga psychotherapist, uh, a registered therapeutic yoga teacher and trainer and a therapist supervisor amongst many other things. And she was saying she stopped kind of putting all the letters behind her name because there were just too many of them. Needless to say, she has a lot of P's and D's in her title. Um, and I met her probably about six months ago, actually at Burning Man. And we hit it off immediately, became great friends. And we got on a phone once because we just wanted to discover what we could learn from each other. And one of the first things I said is, I need to interview you because you've got a lot of great information that I think my people would really benefit from. So we're here. Welcome, Michelle. Why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about who you are and like how you got it, all these P's and D's after your name. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, let's see, you know, I started out as a really nerdy science, science person when I was younger. And actually, I'll backtrack even just a little bit before that. I always had this um, feeling in me ever since I was a little kid that my purpose was to marry science and spirituality. And I really didn't even know what that meant when I was young, but I had this sense inside of me. And so fast forward to um, uh, college, and I was a biomedical science major, and I was fully on track with all my organic chem classes and everything like that. And what started to happen for me is that... Um, I, I kind of hit an emotional rock bottom, if you will. I was about 20 years old, so I was in my second year of college, and um, I went to go see a college college therapist, okay. and it didn't really experience very much relief. It was helpful to speak, just to talk, but I didn't experience very much relief, and around that same time, my grandmother, um, who was a transcendental meditation teacher and had learned you know, over in India in the 70s, she came and taught me transcendental meditation. And that it was fascinating that um, the way it shifted my brain biochemistry just sent all these bells and whistles dinging inside of me. And I got fascinated in the neuropsychology of the integration of meditation and, and the brain. And I wanted to study it. But this was back in the late 90s. And so aside from maybe one school in California and one school in Colorado, there weren't very many opportunities, um, at, a, at least at a master's level, to study meditation and psychology. So it pretty much curated my direction to Boulder. And, uh, <laughs> and so I ended up... Of all the forward-thinking people. In yeah. <laughs> And so I ended up at Naropa in Boulder and started studying the integration of meditation and psychology. And unfortunately, I also had a very um, solid clinical background from all of my biomed work in, um, in, in the mainstream schools. And when I got out of college, I was like most grad students, or I'm sorry, when I got out of grad school, I was like most grad students where I ended up working in state-run facilities like group homes and community mental health centers. And what I discovered was that people had so much um, physical energy in their body, so much trauma energy, so, much, so many held patterns. And again, these are kids and adults that have had more therapists in their lifetime than I have hair on my head probably. You know, they've just been tons of trauma growing up, tons of trauma in their adulthood, tons of trauma just living in a group home. And I realized that not everybody could sit down and meditate. Yeah. And so I started to look for um, ways in which to work with the held energy in the body and the old patterns. And so very slowly, things started to evolve from there. And I'll, I can talk more about that, but I'm going to stop and see if you have any questions. Yeah, that's a beautiful segue. Thank you. So you mentioned a couple of things like held energy in the body, trauma patterns, 
can you give us some examples so we can kind of con bring this down to something concrete that perhaps people can relate to that we've all experienced? Like, what would be some examples of trauma patterns that these, chi these children might have displayed or that we might display as human beings so people can mm -hmm. get a sense of like what trauma actually looks like? Is anytime your nervous system has one of those <clears throat> moments, right? So your, your sympathetic nervous system, the part of your nervous system that really wants to help you survive and make sure that everything is feeling really good for you, that part is going to activate. And when that part activates, then things can get a little bit chaotic in the brain. We send cortisol running through the body and a few other things happen in the brain that actually, um, for lack of a better term, hardwire a particular image or a particular experience into your memory system, both into your muscle memory and into your cognitive memory. So if we're going to bring this down to some uh, concrete ideas, you talked, I would probably call this being triggered. Like you get triggered, your amygdala, the reptilian part of your brain goes on survival alert. We enter that kind of fight or flight mode. Um, and what I'm hearing you say is that when this happens, when we're younger or even when we're older, it, if it's, a, if it's a, a, a serious threat that we could call a trauma, it gets wired into our brain in kind of almost like a fixed way and our response is wired in with it. So the way we, that's what I'm kind of uh, yeah. saying here. Like the way we react or responded to the initial event becomes wired in and then in future instances, anything that looks like that will go straight to that response. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, pretty much. And let's even take it down a notch and say, it doesn't have to be, we, we think of fight or flight and survival in the terms of, oh my God, this is like a big thing, like I'm kidnapped or maybe there's a sexual assault or um, there's physical abuse. But I'm talking about it at the level of anything that makes your nervous system think, okay, things might not be okay. This could be listening to your parents fight at nighttime. This could be um, your mom depressed and not being able to get out of bed. And so um, you're not able to, you know, when your needs are, are when you're young, especially when you have needs um, and they're not met in a consistent way, then that creates a learned experience of hypervigilance, of always on the, on the look to see if something's going to happen or if you can get your needs met, if you can get it fed regularly or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So can you give us a couple more examples? Those are beautiful of trauma, like everyday trauma that perhaps everybody has had, because I know in our previous conversations, we're talking about everybody's had some kind of trauma. It doesn't have to be yeah. you're a Vietnam vet and you're suffering from PTSD. Yeah. Like what are some of the, the more common things that you see in your practice every day? Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, I'm also going to create a little bit of a frame for us in terms of we'll, we'll, we'll say the word trauma a lot. And in trauma, I'm also going to include the term neglect. And so neglect is um, sort of like, if you think of trauma as like, oh my God, like a scary sort of thing, neglect is, is just as harmful, but in, and sometimes even more harmful, but more in the framework of an absence of attention. Okay. So an absence of um, attention in the form of not, not being emotionally attuned to. So this is an example. So I used to um, tell people that I grew up in a leave it to beaver home because I kind of thought I did. And my parents okay, sort of thought that. Say that again. You grew up in a what kind of home? Oh, leave it to beaver. Okay. So this won't be great for cultural, for like cross-cultural, but so it, it, it was an old, old TV show where the family was just like perfectly happy and everything. Oh, and, um, you know, the, the male fulfilled his traditional role, the mom fulfilled her traditional role, et cetera. And one of the things um, that my parents used to tell me, or my dad used to say, is like, what do you have to complain about? We feed you, um, we shelter you, we love you, we you know, send you to school, we don't beat you, you know? And that was kind of the bar, like you, you have your basic needs met, was the bar for healthy love, which was a pretty low bar. Yeah. But you have to think about, you know, they came from, in America, their parents were part of the Great Depression. And so they came from a Midwest farm family where the boys got beat with a belt, you know, if they did something wrong. And so, again, you know, when we look at generationally speaking, that bar seemed like a pretty decent thing. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, as I look back and as I learned more, um, being emotionally attuned, like... Uh, showing up for my emotional needs was just as an important piece. And that's the kind of um, 
subtle trauma that people, I think, experience that then impacts their relationships with their romantic partner. And that's one of the biggest things is how your parents attuned to you. Right. So that kind of creates your attachment style. You know, in, in mm -hmm. training uh, that I, I work with the couples, I use the term hailstorm for anxious <laughs> people, turtles uh -huh. or avoidantly attached people. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm going to start using potentially the porcupine for the fearful avoidant or disorganized attachment style. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I love these. I love these. Yeah. <laughs> it creates a really like, easy image. Easy image. And what I'm hearing you say is our attachment styles come out of very commonly out of neglect. I was... Um, and abuse. Yeah. And abuse. Okay. Neglect yeah. and abuse. And perhaps the most difficult attachment style to work through is that just what they call disorganized or fearful avoidant mm -hmm. and by definition people who uh fall under that attachment style have come from homes where it was chaotic and love often gets wired in with fear and the desire to bond gets wired in with the desire to protect oneself and these mm -hmm. people have the hardest time in relationships and that's really why i wanted to talk to you the most was because I would say perhaps one in 10 people I work with falls under this disorganized or fearful avoidant or porcupine attachment style. And they want to be close. And at the same time, the minute they get close, they bolt because they've got this fear and love wired together Absolutely. at the same time. And so what I'm wondering is um, what happens to these people when they don't heal the trauma, perhaps they, maybe you had an alcoholic parent and one minute uh, dad was loving and then a few hours later he was drunk and he beat you or he was yelling at mom. And you learned that you're, the person who's supposed to protect you was also a source of fear or danger. How do these people, uh, you know, if they, if they go through life and they get into romantic relationships as adults, what happens if they don't deal with their trauma? Yeah. So basically what happens is, and it's not even something that you can do just cognitively, as I'm sure you found out, right? Because somebody can tell you, somebody can talk to you about all the things you should and shouldn't do. But when you're in the moment and when you're in the heat of passion, um, all of that stuff just flies out the window, right? Yeah. And so um, what happens if you don't deal with some of these things is that, A, you don't know that what that it's happening when it's happening. And then B, you just recapitulate that same pattern over and over again. And um, we don't have to get into it today, but basically if you run a thought pattern, think about um, watering a plant, right? You know, the roots get even stronger and the plant grows even bigger so then it can like encompass more rain, more waters. So whatever signals are coming into your brain, they could theoretically goes to some other place in your brain, but because that particular neural pathway is so expansive, it's going to take any signal and read that signal as, oh, this is like that thing that happened back then, even if it's not. So to say it in another way is that it makes you misperceive some of the signals that are coming in as threats. As threats. Okay, so I need to pause you for a second. You said like five like profound things that I just <laughs> highlight and underline for everybody listening. So one of them uh, is that, okay, so we have a childhood uh, trauma, something bad happens, and then our brain kind of almost blankets across every other experience. If it looks even vaguely or smells even vaguely similar to what happened the first time, we go straight back into using the strategy that worked the first time. And for mm -hmm. most people who struggle with trauma, this is usually some form of get aggressive and defend or get the hell out fast and, and bolt. Or... Yeah shut down and freeze. Um, one of those, what they call, you've probably all heard this, uh, those of you listening, fight, flight, or freeze. And this gets wired into our, I'm just going to call it our survival system, our amygdala, our reptilian brain. And when something similar comes up and we get triggered, what I'm hearing you say, Michelle, and I, this is what I've experienced myself too, is we lose control and we really don't have the cognitive ability to talk ourselves down because our amygdala, which is kind of a uh, pre-rational brain, takes over and says, I need to fight and defend you, or I need to run and get the hell out of here in order to keep us alive. And so why I'm wanting to underline this is I'm hoping partners of people who've had trauma, if you're listening to this, you can start to see your partner's 
what you might have previously thought of as out of control or crazy or reactive reaction is not something they necessarily have cognitive control of in the moment if they haven't done a lot of therapy or work on it. It's unconscious. It suddenly comes up like this and an old strategy from the past comes up. The other thing I heard you saying or implying is that trauma is stored in our memory without time. And I remember reading this uh, in my studies of trauma that trauma is coded very quickly because our brain, you know, when, when we're in a fight or flight situation, when we're under threat, doesn't want to be thinking about what's happening. It bypasses the hippocampus, the part of our brain that records time and location. And these memories get stored without time and location. So when they get triggered again, our brain can't distinguish that the trauma isn't happening now. It actually experiences it as, as, as if it is happening now. Sorry, I lost my English there for a second. <laughs> Please correct me. It's what I'm saying accurate? I don't want to... Yeah, 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 basically. And um, I wanted to add that uh, just a really quick thing around um, the brain science piece of... so. Your, your limbic system, your, fi your fight or flight system, your survival system. And I, I want to back up and just say that, of course, our limbic system is absolutely necessary and cortisol and these stress hormones are absolutely necessary. So what gets us up in the morning and all these things, but it's when they are in an overabundance in our system that things become problematic. And um, so when the limbic system is engaged, it gets dibs on all of the resources in the brain or most of the resources in the brain, right? And that makes sense because it's tasked with our survival. Okay. And so anytime your limbic system is engaged, it's going to steal resources from what's called your prefrontal cortex, which is the executive function of your brain. And that's the part of you, if you think about humans at their best or, um, the part of you that was maybe in the honeymoon phase of your relationship, you're creative, you're happy, you're empathetic, you're, you know, you're just fully in. And, and so when the limbic system is engaged, it's stealing the resources from the prefrontal cortex, which is where all, also all of those um, skills that you teach everybody are stored until they become habit, right? Once they become habit, then sometimes you can still access them even though your limbic system is engaged. Does that make sense? Totally. So what I'm hearing you say is that when we're triggered and our limbic system comes online, everything you've basically learned goes out the window yeah. because yeah. it's too resource heavy and will require your brain to use extra resources that it should mm -hmm. be or, or better assigned to survival, except mm -hmm. that now your life is not under threat. So to continue example, let's say it's create a hypothetical example. You're a child, you've had an alcoholic parent and you got beaten a few times when your parent was drunk and your parent was yelling at their spouse a lot and you learned to survive by perhaps uh, keeping quiet going numb and retreating mm -hmm. how come now as an adult in a relationship when your, your life isn't under threat and your partner criticizes you we just go numb and withdraw and retreat just like we did then what's the process that makes that happen just so that people can understand and where I'm coming from is I'm hoping the spouses of these people we can help them understand what's going on for their partners so that they can have some empathy and compassion and realize that their spouse isn't crazy their spouse right. is consciously trying to create drama that it's really an unconscious reaction right so to to really fully answer this I'm gonna take us back a little bit and so if you'll hold the like kind of nugget of the question in case I get a little bit off track and just feel free to interrupt and remind me but um, so to do to really answer this we sort of have to go back and understand that um, so when we're infants you know before we have any control over anything um, our survival needs are of course food right and um, love, so the basic two, I mean, obviously water or shelter, that kind of stuff, but the basic two, like food, so we'll just talk about nourishment in general. Um, they've, they've shown that infants in orphanages have um, some of the same malnourishment from the lack of touch and the lack of connection that babies who are in, um, like maybe other countries that have actual physical malnourishment. And so, um, so love is a survival need. Um, love is how we learn empathy. It's how we learn connection. It's how we learn um, 
it's how we down regulate our nervous system enough for all the other things to function for us to grow. So we actually track a lot of survival need. Down regulate, just take, put that in English. Cool. Yes, so down regulate means to just calm down our nervous system. Remember, because if our nervous system is calm, then our prefrontal cortex gets to be part of the game. So you're saying touch is one of the ways we calm down. And if we don't get it as children, these mm -hmm. orphans are constantly in a state of danger or threat. Their brain is releasing tons of cortisol into their system and mm -hmm. they can't learn as well. They, they, they don't, their brain doesn't develop as fast, I've read. They yeah, um, or, or they, they don't right because because um you know they they're not getting any of the nourishment they need um so they just sort of do a, a shutdown sort of thing mm -hmm. so early on and it doesn't even and this could be um birth trauma as well in terms of maybe you were a preemie and you had to be in the neonatal ward for a while um or maybe you were sick as a child or any of these things it doesn't even have to be quite so intense it could be just that your mom was a type a person and she ran a multi-million dollar business yeah. and so you had some nannies and you had some people that take took care of you but that deep emotional bonding just wasn't present and so love as a survival need is wired into us from the very very beginning of our lives and so fast forward to romantic relationships Friendships are fine. Friendships are, they are not your primary attachment caregiver, right? Like your income doesn't depend on, you know, your, or your, your food and all that stuff. It doesn't really depend on your friends. It depends on your primary attachment caregiver. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we are wired to bond with one person. When we have a trauma in relationship to that bond, uh, mm -hmm. and I've heard it could also be invasive surgery. It could have been kind of any kind of uh, trauma, but what you're saying is that traumas can be just every day. Somebody was like, mom was busy working, and then it gets wired in. And I, I don't want to kind of harp on too too long about the process, but I, when we're adults, why does it still come up now? Like, why do we get so reactive now? When we're right, adults? because. Um, and I just want to back up for a quick second. We're not necessarily wired for one person, but we're wired for primary attachment caregiving. If you grew up in a village and people always showed up for you and you had six or seven mamas and dads, that would be fine, fine. right? Like you would still develop secure attachment. Um, okay, so jumping forward to your question, but whoever, whatever our, whatever our constellation was as a child, that's what we will tend to want to reproduce as an adult. And so when you're with your romantic partner, this is your survival attachment, your love, your primary attachment. And so when things feel a little bit iffy, maybe it's um, you come in and you don't look at me right away. Mm. <laughs> and so that's an immediately like, Oh, what's going on? And as a, as a woman, um, I'm always looking for, mm, I'm always looking for signals that my relationship might be under threat. This is an evolutionary component of women because as women, we are smaller and over the years we've needed, um, tribe protection and specifically the alpha male protection as well. Yeah. And so, I am always like bonding and attachment. I am hyper, hyper attuned to that as a woman, all women in general. And so I'm constantly looking for signals that my bond with you might be a little bit less so that I have to do something. But as soon as I notice that it's a little bit less, if I have trauma, um, even little, little bits of trauma from childhood, it's immediately going to send my sympathetic nervous system into activation so I can start to, and how I, however I respond to that is my pattern. Like maybe I'll like lash out at you or maybe I'll just get cold shouldery or whatever. Okay. Got it. Got it. So what I'm hearing you say is that the reason why as adults this comes up is because the same kind of bond forms with our romantic partner as was formed with our primary caregivers. And because that wound is in relationship to an attachment figure, our romantic partner now being the attachment figure kind of inherits all, us and all of our wounding. And it's almost like if time isn't uh, stored in memory when it comes to trauma, yeah. we're being traumatized by our parent, basically, the person we're counting on for survival. And it registers as a survival threat, like a threat to our life. Absolutely. We react as if somebody was holding a gun to our head or a knife to our throat, fight, flight, freeze. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. 
Can I give you um, a, yes. a personal example from that? I'd love it. I'm loving this conversation, by the way. Okay. It's so rich. Yeah, me too. I know. I'm, I was looking at the time. I was like, oh my gosh, it's going so fast. <laughs> um, so, so when I was, so I was, um, I was adopted from an orphanage in Korea, and we can um, talk about that a little bit later if there's time. But this particular example, so my adoptive parents, amazing, loving, you know, to the best of their ability. And I'm always gonna say to the best of their ability. And um, they were sort of Midwest farm folk in America. And so, you know, not, not particularly deeply emotionally attuned. And we've had this conversation. So if they listen to this, they'll, they'll be like, yep, yep. <laughs> um, but I had this experience where my dad, um, at one point in time, I was, I was so afraid to ask my dad for anything. He was not abusive. He just wasn't emotionally connected to me. My mom was a very anxious woman. And so I sort of absorbed some of her anxiety. And, you know, I had my own stuff from, from the adoption as well. And this one time I was sitting as probably I don't know, 11 or something like that. And my um, mom was like, why don't you ask dad if he wants to play a game with us? We played board games at night sometimes. And he was sitting about seven feet away in the kitchen or in the, in the living room, listening to this whole conversation that we're having. And I'm like, no, no, I'm too scared. And my mom's like, no, no, just ask him, honey, just ask him. And we went back and forth like that. And finally, like I got up the you know, gumption to go ask him. And so I'm already afraid, right? So I'm just like shaking, nervous, asking my dad. And I go and ask him, do you want to play a game with me and mom? And this little voice, he's like, no. Nope. Oh. <laughs> and I was just like, it just like crushed me. And the thing that came up out of that though, and, and I realized it probably only a few years ago is that I stopped asking for things from like, let me rephrase it. I stopped asking for my vulnerable needs to be met. I would ask for things from a partner, but when I felt vulnerable about something, I never asked for it. And so I would just sort of shut down and just assume I, I would keep myself safe from that feeling instead of asking them for it. And so I curated a, uh, for a long time relationships where my vulnerable needs weren't met. And you got used to that, I imagine. And I got used to that, and, but I wasn't ever satisfied, right? So then that created a cycle of conflict in my relationship because my vulnerable needs were never met because I would choose people who couldn't meet them Yeah. because yeah. that was what was familiar to me. Makes so much sense. Yeah. So given the time is running, I wanna kind of like segue into the next big question that I imagine is on all of our hearts and minds is what can we do about this? Like, how do you heal trauma? Firstly, can we heal childhood trauma? Uh, uh, and if so, how do we go about doing that? Yeah. So if you think about the number one thing, the body, so we're going to talk about this from a body and a nervous system perspective. The number one thing the body and the nervous system needs is to feel safe. And when you feel safe, then your nervous system calms down. Then you start to have access to, you know, all of your, your, your skills that, that you teach people in relationship coaching and all of your other resources. So relaxation and calming the body is one of the number one things. And so I imagine one of your questions is when people are freaking out or avoiding, how do you do that? How do you relax? <laughs> how do you do that? Right. So, this is the, kind of the, the difficult navigation, which I, you know, I'm sure you teach beautifully, is when one person's young parts or old traumas are coming up and another person's young parts or old traumas are coming up and they're going head to head, mm -hmm. how do you deal with that? It really falls upon the partner who is a little bit less triggered, even if it's 1% less triggered, to be able to take a second and say, can my young part step aside for just a moment so that I can be in my adult and calm my nervous system down with long breaths and other practices um, so that I can hold a container for this person? And so in therapy, we have a thing that says, whoever has control of the breath has control of the session. And that is true in couples work. So if you can downregulate your nervous system enough so that you can access what is it that my partner really needs right now okay. oh he or she needs just connection or he or she needs me to just not be reactive right now or just to be held you know then that's where the you start to move forward 
Okay, got it. So one of the things I'm hearing you talk about is something I teach in week two of my program, which is about soothing your partner, down-regulating your partner, basically. Mm -hmm. So what I hear you saying is the person who's less triggered is responsible for initiating that kind of soothing. Yeah. And then the one way you can download, uh, down-regulate or calm down your nervous system is by taking deep breaths. And for those of you who just think it's any kind of deep breaths, the research actually shows that if you, I think it's if you breathe out three times longer than you breathe in, it has that a- feels, That feels hard. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's start with them just at twice as long. Twice as long, okay, okay. Yeah. Twice as long as you breathe in, you actually end up calming your nervous system. And you, right. Yeah. Can I offer another option? Please, many. Yeah, so there, there's all kinds of things um, that help, but when, if you're really anxious, because both partners might be triggering this like anxiety reaction as well, you know, um, oftentimes it's the woman who is um, very, ex you know, excitable, if you will, um, but it, it could just as easily be the man too. And so um, when you're in an anxious mode, sometimes breath doesn't work and that's when you have to do something more physical in the body. And so I like to call it the shimmy or the shake. And you basically, it's like imagining that you're in a mosh pit and you're 14 again or something. And um, you're, you literally shake your whole body, not like the pretty shake, but like you, like you're having a spaz attack and you jump up and down and shake. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, you really have to like get into it for like good 10 seconds where like every single limb is like moving around and and what it does is it helps discharge some of the stored cortisol, some of the stored stress hormone. And that's a great way to help you um, interrupt both your thought process that's happening and calm your nervous system or bring it more into balance. Beautiful, I love that. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about the body. I know one of the things you're an expert in is somatic healing. Tell us a little bit about when you're working one-on-one, -on -one, um, because this is actually why I got you here in the first place. I wanted to refer some of my people to a therapist that I trusted to do some one-on-one -on -one therapy, particularly people who've had traumatic experiences, and it's haunting them in their relationships. Mm -hmm. you're working with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, what are some of the just big picture type processes that you do with people to help them let go or to heal their trauma if, if we were kind of like a fly on the wall in your therapy room what what kind of things would we see you doing with your clients to help them heal trauma right and this can also be done over the web as well and so i'll just have you um just really briefly do a quick experiment for yourself so how about you turn your head to the right except only go about 70 percent of the way like that yeah and then just slowly go towards the left about 70 percent of the way as well and maybe do it one or two more times. And then come back through center. And then do it one more round, but go slower than that. And so what do you notice? I feel very calm and relaxed. <laughs> Why do you feel calm and relaxed? I have no idea. <laughs> Why do I feel so calm and relaxed? I mean, maybe so, I feel 40% calmer. I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was anxious, but I was kind of like, okay, we're doing an interview. I need to be on. I need to be super. <laughs> and I was like, maybe a little bit in my head. I feel much more dropped into my body and probably about 40 Yeah. So even just something like that, you're just dropped into your body. But this is the thing with stretching. So if I stretch and turn my head all the way as far as I can, uh -huh. then I have created a little bit of tension in my body, in my physical body. That's stretching. We, we go towards because there's an instant gratification to stretching. Like, oh, I'm going to stretch really good, really big. Oh, and then I'm going to feel better. But it's more like an instant gratification because what you're doing is if you stretch all the way, you create more tension. But if you just bring some movement, and so when you're moving, you're releasing energy, right? Because you're, you're actually having to use energy to move. So when you're moving, but you only go towards about 70%, you're going to the, about the right place for complete relaxation in terms of muscular you know, control. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. Not yeah, so you're, you're moving the body, but you're not doing it in a way that creates more tension. Perfect. Now tie that into healing trauma. Yeah, so when you are 
feeling like you've got all this stored stress hormone, you know, you're, cause you're activated, right? Your nervous system is activated. The tendency would be to just push through something or to completely avoid something and freeze. So if you're normally somebody who freezes and shuts down or goes away and checks out in your head, bringing movement, slow movement into the moment keeps you engaged. And if you're somebody who barrels through sensation, doing the slow movement actually helps you slow down and bring yourself back into presence. Slowing down. Okay, got it. So the slow helps you either slow down or helps bring you back up if you're a shutdown person. So it's kind of one of those, it catches it all. Got it. Okay. And then, how, okay, so let's say in our hypothetical example from earlier, we're working with somebody who has had an abusive parent, they were an alcoholic, and you know, perhaps they're the fearful avoidant or porcupine type, where these desire to bond and the desire to um, protect oneself is hardwired together or crosswired. Like, how do you get rid of the past, so to speak? How do you stop these past memories traumatizing you in the present? Like, what kind of therapeutic work mm -hmm. needs to happen? Yeah, so a lot of that is learning to relax into the body in the moment because what you're doing again is when you are in a fight or flight or freeze response, you're in the moment of trauma. And in your, when you're in the moment of the trauma, either you are literally frozen into a particular habitual pattern um, or you're getting ready to like jet out of there or protect yourself. Either way, your nervous system is not in its optimal functioning rate. So what we do in the moment is, is, is help you create some new pathways. Remember, anytime you use a pathway, you're strengthening that pathway. Yeah, so we help you create new pathways in the moment simply by with like the guide it's like as if you were a child and that was happening but you had this like guardian angel next to you soothing you and helping you know learn the direction that you would take so so basically that's what's happening is that when you're in that moment it's almost like you've time traveled back to that thing but now you have somebody with you in session helping you cue your breath helping you oh look i noticed your shoulder just came up like that can you bring your shoulder down and so you're literally re-patterning what's happening in your body Got it. So it's almost like you've got a guardian angel, like that's you. Um, <laughs> and then as, you're, as the trauma comes up in the moment, because your brain can't distinguish time when it's triggered like this, as far as it's concerned, it's happening, the trauma's happening all over, all over again right now. Yeah. What you're doing this time is you're guiding the person you're working with to new, more resourced responses, things that mm -hmm. will actually get them uh, the result that they want, protect them or protection or safety or whatever it is that they're, they're trying to create in a way that hadn't worked before, you're teaching them new unconscious automatic responses, mm -hmm. wire them in through habituation, I imagine, so that next time when that trigger gets, comes up in the relationship with a romantic partner, they A, have the awareness to see what's happening and B, they've practiced already and learned new skills for regulating and resourcing themselves again so they don't have to act out in the, I guess, ineffective way that they were in the past, uh, or that perhaps they've been doing their whole life. Did I Absolutely. get it? Absolutely. Kind of yeah. lay the land. Yeah. And, and so it's kind of like a trifecta experience. You know, there's a, there's a conversation that happens in session, right? Because I have to know what's going on and what are some of the triggers that are happening. And then there's the body-centered psychotherapy piece where we really look at and work with what are some practices to bring into your body to help you calm your nervous system and be back in present connection with yourself. And then there's also a resourcing part where maybe we'll do some neurosculpting, which is um, maybe a subject for a whole nother time, but um, where you learn to literally through guided meditation, rewire some of the habitualized patterns in you. Beautiful, amazing. Okay, so I imagine people are wondering how they can work with you. Beneath this video, you'll find Michelle's telephone number, you'll find her website, I'll put it all there for you. I'm just gonna scan my questions and just see if there was anything else that I wanted to ask you that was important. Oh, yeah, I guess my final question here that I was curious about personally was like, how long does it take to heal like these kinds of traumas? So if I was, uh, you know, perhaps this, disorganized attachment style and had an alcoholic parent, are we looking at a month, three months of working with, like, what's the, I'm sure it's different for everyone, but just if you could yeah. broad strokes, give us some idea. Yeah, you know, what I'll say is that it depends a lot on your resources and on your motivation. 
and um, you know, like if you have some time, the time and resources to really prioritize this work, you can see results immediately. And I don't mean to say that, I mean, we are who we are and our patterns are our patterns. And I don't mean to say that you will never have to deal with this ever, ever again. And will you be able to notice what shows up and work with it in the moment? Absolutely. So in terms of having a better relationship, I mean, you can start to see results right away. Okay. And when you say if you are resourced, what, what do you mean by that? Like you can get results quickly. You're not right. If you have lots of money and you can pay me a fortune. I know that's not what you were saying. No, 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 no. I mean, I've heard so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying. So, um, Resource means that you have some of the basic needs in your life already stable. So, I mean, if you are like, if your job is really unstable and you're constantly, constantly stressed out about your job, I mean, handling all the stressors in your life are going it, to, it's, it's, it's a, um, it's a difficult thing if, if there's a lot. And if the relationship though is the primary piece, then that means you have a lot of other resources to attend to the relationship work and to the self-healing work. Okay, got it. So if you're and time, time, time is also a resource. Time's a resource. Time is a resource. If you're like going 16 hours a day and you don't have time to, you know, sit and be quiet for a little while with yourself, that also is, um, makes things take a little bit longer. So would it be accurate to say that if you've got some resources and you're willing to dedicate some time to this, you can heal your childhood traumas in a matter of a month or two? Like, I'm guessing. I just um, I would love to say that if you have some time and resources to attend to the matter, you can make some significant insights and dents in a month or two. And in terms of healing childhood trauma long term, I think it might always be a, a walk, you know? It's, it's part of the path. And I think that, um, I don't know that there's anybody that can say in terms of healing childhood trauma, we can put a time limit on it for anybody, but you can feel significant. I've had clients um, make significant shifts in their life uh, in a matter of two or three months. Brilliant. And that's so been my experience too. The matter of two or three months is, is generally what it takes. And that the way I think about it, attachment trauma, like I'm anxiously attached and I'll probably have anxious attachment for the rest of my life. Yeah. And that's okay, but I don't act like an anxiously attached person anymore. My behavior right. changed. So I still feel those feelings of abandonment sometimes coming up or, or whatever that they are. But with the tools that I've learned and the healing, the work that I've done, I don't have to act out on it like I used to. Like I used to be very difficult to be in relationships. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, that's where we're, we're going to here. And I don't even know if we want to get rid of all our trauma and our memory, which is what I feel like a lot of people want to do, because a lot of the time our trauma is what makes us who we are, makes us unique. It, it comes with unique gifts that we wouldn't right. have learned any other way. And I think it's very easy to ignore that it comes with gifts. I know my anxious attachment style has made me hyper empathetic and mm -hmm. my emotional intelligence is way higher than most men because mm -hmm. of my relational focus, because of my attachment style. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't be able to do the work with couples that I do if I hadn't had the childhood that I'd had, even though there were times when it really wasn't pleasant. I wouldn't yeah. be in the world anymore because of the gifts it's given me. And I imagine for those of you listening who can relate to having some kind of trauma, one of the things Michelle's going to do with you as well is help you see the benefits of what the trauma has provided. Um, I think that basically what, what all people want, what I want, what you want, is that we all want to feel like we have our own agency in our life. Like we want to feel... That for people who are familiar with the term agency. I'm sorry? Can you translate agency yes. like independence? Or yeah. Like, I mean, it, we, we just want to be in charge of our own life. We want to be, as in, in meditations, I offer people the idea that they can be the architect of their own experience in the guided meditation. And same thing in life. I think regardless of what traumas we've had or not had, we just want to be able to be in charge of our choices in present time and not be hijacked by things that have nothing to do with right here, right now. Mm. Thank you. This has been yeah. an amazing time. I know one of the things you said to me when we last spoke was that 
you offer a free 30 minute kind of exploration call. Yeah, just a three phone, a free 30 minute phone consultation. Okay, perfect. So what would you prefer if people want to explore working with you? Would you prefer them to call you, email you, like, and, and set up this? You know, they're welcome to email me, but um, that's, again, what the 30-minute phone consult is for. So in my website at the bottom of the page on, some, on most pages and on the side on some pages oh, is a schedule appointment button. And when you schedule the appointment button, it'll take you directly to my online scheduler, and you can select the one that says 30-minute initial free consultation, and it automatically will adjust for time zones. So just make sure you put your time zone in correctly. Okay, um, beautiful. I'll link to that below the video. Thank you, Michelle. I so appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule. I know uh, you're in demand, and uh, this was thrilling for me, and I learned a lot. It was super fun for me, too. Thanks, Bruce. All righty. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye.